Hi, we're in section 852. So let's set up a rectangular waveguide and shoot a wave down it with the condition that the electric field must be pointing in the YZ plane and not in the X direction at all. It's transverse electric field, uh, transverse electric wave. So we have a rectangular waveguide um, with uh, inner height A, inner width B, and um, we shall try to solve it using the equation that we had covered earlier. Uh, which says basically d squared by dy squared plus d squared by dz squared plus omega over c squared minus kappa squared uh, applied to ex equals zero and the same applied to bx has to be equal to zero. Um, well in this case we assume that ex is equal to zero so there's a trivial solution right there that was easy uh, but bx um, is definitely not zero um, if it were, then we would have a problem. So Bx depends on y and z. And we're going to pull into our physicist handbook of ways to solve complicated equations like these and do it into uh, separation of variables. So uh, the Bx consists of two components, y and z. y depends only on y, z depends only on z. They're multiplied together. Um, we might not get a solution that solves everything, but we'll at least get a solution that we can add to a bunch of other solutions and get the final solution, just like we did when we were calculating potentials way back, I think, in chapter four, or three, or whatever it was. So plugging this into this guy up here, well, d by dy squared is going to be uh, y. No, no, no. We're going to take the z is going to stay constant, and we have d by dy. So d, uh, well, just straight d by dy of the y. And same thing for the z, d by dz. Well, the y doesn't depend on z, so let's just take d by dz of z. These are squares. These are doubles. Plus uh, the fantabulously not um, calculatic, if that's even a word, um, equals 0. OK. If we divide everything by yz, we get uh, 1 over y times d by dy squared of y plus 1 over z times d by dz squared of z plus uh, so this only depends on y, that only depends on the and that depends on none of the above. And so the only way this could work is if the y term is constant and the z term is constant so the y term we'll call that the k y squared we'll call it minus k y squared and we're going to call this one minus k z squared um, using minus signs because we know what the solution is going to look like it's going to be sine of something and then we have plus omega over c squared minus kappa squared uh, not to be confused with the k let's make the case higher there. And that is all going to have to equal to zero. So the general solution um, for the y, so this has to equal that, so the y must be something like a sine ky times the y coordinate plus b cosine ky times the y coordinate. So that will work, um, except for when we apply the boundary conditions. Remember that just inside the surface, the electric field has to be, the electric field that's parallel has to be zero, but the perpendicular magnetic field must also be zero. Um, so at y equals zero, and y equals a, we have the condition that uh, by so a equals zero it has, has to be uh, has to be uh, y equals zero b um, by has to be zero and so that says that this term is no good to us no is that right or do we keep that term
Uh, regardless, that term drops. Um, uh, anyway, uh, ky must be something like m pi over a, where m is some integer. And we get the same kind of thing for kz, except for z is equal to something. Um, z is equal to some, well, it's going to be some constant. And we're going to multiply it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Something times cosine of kz. Is that what I called it? Yeah, kz uh, times the z component. And so kz is equal to n pi over a, where n is equal to 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. And so our total solution is that bx has to equal some constant b naught times cosine of m pi y times cosine of n pi z over b over b. Okay. Um, that's because the z direction is by. This is z and y. Um, this is the y direction, that's the z direction. We assume that the y direction is bigger than the z direction when we have non-equal, when we don't have squares, um, just by convention. So um, can we choose m and n both equal to 0? The answer is no, we can't. There's a problem, 32, 8.32, where you get to discover why that is. and I glossed over why that has to be in the previous section because I didn't want to solve that problem for you and also because I didn't remember at the time. But uh, regardless, um, the wave number K, kappa, let's solve for kappa. Let's solve for this dude. What is he equal to? Uh, we get kappa is equal to, so kappa is equal to the square root of a whole bunch of stuff, omega over c squared. Then we have pi times m over a uh, plus m over b. And we get, um, that's our kappa for the wave traveling down the wave guide. Um, if we have, um, we'll notice that there's a particular frequency that is interesting. We call this omega mn, which is equal to c, the speed of light, times pi, times the square root of stuff, m over a plus n over b squared. Um, if we have a frequency that is, if when omega is smaller than omega mn, then our um, wave number, our kappa, ends up becoming uh, imaginary, right? So we've taken the square root of a negative number. Um, this is omega mn. When our frequency is smaller than that, we get um, that mess. And so what does that mean to have a kappa that is imaginary? Well, that just means that your wave is attenuating. When you plug that kappa into e to the i k x, you get e to the minus something x, which means you, the wave is just disappearing down the tube. So this is called the cutoff frequency. Frequencies below this won't travel down the waveguide. Um, the lowest cutoff frequency occurs at the W10 state, which would be uh, just C pi m over A. I'm sorry, C pi one over A, C pi over A. Um, any frequency smaller than that, and then none of the modes can carry the wave at all. So you get nothing. You just it just attenuates rapidly down the tube. Um, we can re oh, let's just rewrite it this way. This can be equal to one over c times the square root of omega squared minus the cutoff frequency squared for that mode. I'm just plugging things and moving them around. Um, the wave velocity so v equals omega over kappa, which when you plug that all in, you get c divided by the square root of one minus omega mn divided by omega, uh, all that squared. And so 
it's quite possible if this number is smaller than one, okay? So when your frequency is not omega mn, if it was to be zero, you can't do that, can you? Hold on a second. Anyway, it's quite possible for velocity to be greater than the speed of light. Um, and as we said earlier, um, that's okay. Um, it turns out the group velocity is the important velocity. And what you're actually seeing, um, so if, if I reframe the conversation here, um, well, okay, what's the group velocity? The group velocity is equal to d omega by dk. And if we calculate that, we can just take the inverse of the um, kappa divided by the kappa with respect to omega, and you get c square root of 1 divided by omega squared. And so the group velocity is most definitely smaller than the speed of light, or at best the speed of light. Um, okay, so why, 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 why do we get this faster than the speed of light and what does it mean? Well, there's another way to think about what's really going on here, is that you have, uh, if you look at one dimension here, so you have your wave and if the wave was perfectly aligned like this, or like this rather, uh, you wouldn't get any wave at all. But if we take the wave and tilt it so that that B field, is that right? Uh, I guess, whatever, let's see, E cross B, actually, okay. So the B field is my thumb. If you tilt it so the B field is not, has some X component to it, that represents a wave that's traveling down. And what happens when a wave hits a conductor? It reflects, okay? And so those waves are actually creating wave fronts that look like that. And so if you look at just a particular spot here, let's use orange. Like let's say you're just watching this spot right here. What's happening is these waves are traveling by you. And it's not hard to see that just like if you're standing on a seashore and the waves are coming not directly towards the seashore, but at some kind of angle. If you watch the ang the the intersection of those frontlets with the the sea the seashore, you'll see that they'll travel much faster than the waves do on the sea, and that's that's okay because it's it's kind of like watching a shadow move faster than the speed of light, which which isn't a big deal at all. Um, so anyway, so this is actually a really good way to look at it. Um, that's what we have. Um, there's some problems in the book that you should work through before you really feel like you've understood this. And next is X section 853 coaxial cables, and then we're done with chapter 8. We can go to chapter 9, the really fun stuff, and wrap up this book. Thanks for your time. Bye.